here's what we're going to do in this webinar. We are going to do a quick demo and show you the framing around air quality in En-ROADS. We're going to talk about the dynamics of air quality in En-ROADS. We're going to talk about multi-solving, addressing climate injustice and many other issues at the same time as climate. Modeling and assumptions for those who are other modelers or technical people, what is behind the calculations in En-ROADS? And then what's next? We're gonna do some mapping. We wanna have some other areas that are out there. That's where we're going. First, I wanna tell a little of the origin story. Why is air here? Air is here in the model now because in about 2011, 2010, after the Copenhagen conference, Beth Sawin said, we're gonna to need to capture co-benefits to climate action. Go watch her TED talk. Uh, Cassandra, can you send that link to her TED talk in chat? It's a fantastic framing of why we think these issues are so critical, why we think it's important to merge the ideas of equity and justice and climate action. Her TEDx talk explains this well. That's why we're here. It's taken a long time. It's been some hard work. The person who did most of the hard work on this particular part of the model is Chris Soderquist. Here's where you can read about him. He's on here and he'll be answering some of the more technical questions. So great job, Chris. He did a lot of the modeling work. We modeled an air quality as the emissions of PM 2.5. It's basically soot. PM means particulate matter. And as facilitators, people may ask you this, particulate matter smaller than 2.5 microns. That's really small. This is a picture of human hair and it shows you how big PM 2.5 is, it's those little red circles, really, really, really small. It's soot. When you are near a forest fire, when you're near a coal-fired power plant, where I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio in the 1970s, you could taste it. When you taste it, that's PM 2.5. That's what we're going to be exploring uh, in the model. And just here's what we're exploring. Here's the main interface of En-ROADS. And the big news is that if you go under here, under impacts, and explore this graph and then under here under impacts uh, the graph of uh, total this is total air pollution emissions so this is emissions of pm 2.5 of and you can see on the left where it's coming from and this is a surprise to me chris i don't know if you remember this moment when i looked at this graph the first time I thought maybe there was a lot from oil and a lot from coal and a little bit from natural gas, which wasn't very smart of me. Natural gas is a gas. You burn it. There aren't particulates in it. That could be PM 2.5. So you'll notice over on the left here, see the gas in blue, the blue area? No, you don't because there's no gas source. So natural gas doesn't produce much at all PM 2.5. What you see here is this brown area of coal. It's almost exclusively coal. The red area is from the burning of oil. That's even from cars. That is relatively small, PM 2.5. Then there's bioenergy. Now you may say, wait, air pollution from cars? There's a lot of pollution from cars. Well, that's going to be like uh, SOx and NOx and surface ozone are some of the things that are not related to this, that are different, that's also another air quality problem. And then there's bioenergy, burning, trees and other uh, biomass to make energy. Those are the sources of it. So um, I'll just show you some of the dynamics. And when you're looking at it yourself, um, and actually it's interesting, I heard before there was someone who's checking this out for the first time. And I know I've kind of assumed that people have already seen some of the other webinars about Andros, but the basic idea here, of course, is that we're calculating global temperature over on the right and taking actions with carbon price and energy efficiency and renewables and things in order to explore carbon, uh, the temperature implications. But what we're doing here with this particular focus is to explore on another important indicator, which is this air pollution indicator. So let's go look at some of the things that really help and when they help. Um, and of course, <laughs> you look over on the left, where is it coming from? It's coming from coal. If it's coming from coal, well, then what we should do is, well, what happens when we tax coal? And you notice when we tax coal, or if you go under here and imagine a world where we actually stop building new infrastructure entirely, 
where you even could imagine cutting utilization of coal, you notice how much this goes down. And this is the central hypothesis that we have. It's about timing. So when you engage other people, point to the time when it helps. When does this help? You ask your political leaders, your uncle, your students, when does it help? Notice that if we immediately have policies to reduce the use of coal, air quality gets better immediately. Immediately on the scale of 80 years where we're also, you know, uh, immediately over the next, you know, decade or so, which is really fast in this time scale of this model. So that's the great news where you get to say to people, taking action on climate helps air quality soon. Now contrast this, these policies I just did, contrast this with how long it helps for these policies to help with temperature. And we know this is a good idea to avoid global warming. However, the time delays are so long in the carbon cycle, in the climate system, in the heat balance of the biogeochemical system of Earth, that temperature doesn't really depart in this scenario I just made until the 2040s or 2050s. See, the blue line is departing from the black line several decades from now. Those uh, results, those impacts are delayed. Air quality is not delayed. And that's a really important distinction. So when you talk about this, the framing is timing. Talk about timing. And as we'll get into in a minute, talk about equity. Talk about when it helps and talk about who it helps. When it helps first, big distinction, and then whom it helps. And the, the second part we'll get to in a minute. So some other tests of the model just to show, well, what else really helps and what you can do. I'm gonna go back over here to uh, air pollution total. We're gonna undo this. So I just showed you reducing coal, but encouraging renewables definitely helps. See that? That reduces coal burning of coal. Air quality gets better. Energy efficiency. Now I'd like you to think, what's gonna help more, transport or buildings and industry? Transport mostly affects oil. So when we have energy efficiency there, it's a relatively modest change and it takes a long time. But buildings and industry energy efficiency helps in a large way and sooner. It really improves air quality quite directly. Carbon price. So we have a lot of partners out there, Citizen Climate Lobby and others who are advocating for carbon prices. We know that you talk about the climate implications. We know you talk about the dividends. And air quality will get better soon if we adopt, say, the carbon fee and dividend policy. And you can simulate what that would do. Of course, you'd want to go under here and have much more specific ways to do it. But the basic idea is that these things all help a good bit. Now, there's some slightly advanced other factors that I thought were kind of interesting. Uh, some of them relate to what you'll hear about with uh, carbon capture and storage, clean coal. Maybe you've seen these signs out there, how fuel cells could capture CO2. Yes, coal, clean carbon neutral coal. In the future, we'll be able to, says uh, Shell, capturing carbon, clean coal. You've heard a lot of conversations about this. So I'd like you to imagine though, this is a technology, the end of a smokestack for coal, and it captures the carbon dioxide, liquefies it, and you could put it underground. Why? Because it would help uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, help global warming. However, think through, wait, what's going to happen to air quality if we do that? Now note, there are other technologies that capture, uh, so, you know, scrub nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide, PM 2.5. You can capture uh, some of those emissions. That's not what I'm talking about. Coal CCS and clean coal is trying to capture the, just the carbon dioxide. Now, what if we did that? What would happen to air quality? Well, go under here, under here, and you could look down and subsidize coal capture, carbon capture and storage, subsidize it, and watch the first watch the temperature over on the top right, 4.1. It keeps some carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. However, what happens to air quality? Well it gets easier 
and uh, less expensive overall to burn coal because we now have these new technologies that can capture the carbon. So there's more of a reason to burn coal with the carbon capture and uh, sequestration technology. We have more coal. Watch coal demand go up. Now some of the CO2 is being captured. However, air quality goes up. That's just one of the dynamics that I thought was kind of interesting, just an, another dynamic that's out there. All right, so these are some of the main things that we have. One note about what we've modeled is air pollution just from energy by source. So it's just the energy emissions. We haven't captured all of them. And I'm gonna show you some of the other, well, we'll do that in a minute. And notice that this is just the energy emissions so that when we reduce deforestation, that doesn't affect it because the model here is capturing energy. We're trying to add that and we're gonna be adding that later. So the overall framing, when you engage other people with air quality, talk about the timing, show how soon it helps, how fantastic that is that it helps soon. The second framing is who it helps. Talk about equity and why and health multi-solving, all of the ways that these actions will help people. Why does it help people? Well, we know it's gonna help people because air quality is such a big global health problem. The World Health Organization says that there are 8 million deaths per year from air pollution. One out of seven, that's a big number of all deaths worldwide are related to air pollution. Not all of them specifically PM 2.5, but it kills a lot of people around the world. How does it kill people? Four of the big drivers, heart disease, respiratory infection, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and lung cancer. And I focused in on these graphs. These graphs are too small for you to see, but let's look closer at it. And this is showing there's real science, real evidence behind this, where it shows CM PM 2.5 in microns per square meter of concentration, that's in the air, PM 2.5 in the air, when you see smoggy air. I grew up in an area with smoggy air. We have that in the United States, China, India, all over the world. The y-axis here, x-axis, shows you more and more 2.5. So if you go from 25 to 50 to 75 to 100, you can see the green line shows the relative risk going up. So here you can see if you have 50 microns per square meter, it looks like it's about a 50% increase. It doubles all the way up here out at much higher levels, a higher chance of lower respiratory infection. So there's real evidence behind the connection between this PM 2.5 emissions and people's health outcomes. Where is it happening? We found this really good graph in nature or map in nature that shows where, and I focused in on it, and you can see the deaths from PM 2.5 around the world. And the bigger the circle, the more the deaths, above 30,000 here in parts of China, here in the Middle East, uh, some big ones in India, but really all over. Here's some in Russia. You can see that this is all over the world. We're seeing people dying prematurely from PM 2.5. The other factor is like who is dying? Disproportionately, people of color in the United States are dying from PM 2.5 exposure, much more than what do we have from people who are white, even or Native American. You can see this blue area shows that PM 2.5 exposure uh, is 20% lower. Excuse me, this is not about deaths. This is just the exposure to the two, PM 2.5, which we know from the previous slides do lead to, pre, pre, to disease and often premature deaths. Here we can see that PM 2.5 exposure is elevated for Latino, other race, Asian Americans, African Americans, Pacific Islanders, and multiracial people in the Northeast and in the mid-Atlantic. This is a problem we call environmental racism, that people are live, or the power plants are often situated, particularly close to these marginalized communities, and so people have more exposure to PM 2.5. There's also an interesting connection with COVID-19. They found that COVID-19 mortality rate for Black Americans is 2.4 times as high as for whites in the United States. And one of the contributing factors is disproportionate levels of air pollution 
in communities of color. So that's one of the contributing factors to the problems that we see with uh, disproportionate deaths from COVID-19. This is causing, costing a lot of money. Put it in the positive sense, someone did a study of the benefits from solar energy in the US from 2017 to 2015. How much money is saved or anticipated to be saved from avoided climate damages from all the growth of solar and wind? Avoided climate damages, $32 billion, said this study. However, the health benefits were 56 billion. So they far outweigh, they far dwarf the financial implications from climate. So the health benefits via air quality, this is a reason if you wanna make a case to someone about spending money as a society, costing money, make the case for why we spend a lot of money dealing with air pollution health impacts. Okay. Now I'd like to shift over and uh, set up Cassandra to talk about some of the resources that we have. I've been talking at a very general level about global dynamics. Uh, as facilitators and just for yourself and engaging people, it can be pretty helpful to tell stories of what people have actually done in different parts of the world to capture both climate benefits and air quality benefits. So uh, Cassandra, I'm gonna move to the next slide. Uh, why don't you tell people about the things we've learned? So um, this first case study is called Nashville Home Uplift in Nashville, Tennessee, here in the United States. And they provided free energy efficiency upgrades for low-income residents. Something that was really powerful about this project is that it really gave people their lives back because by having a more energy efficient home, they were able to heat their whole home or cool their whole home, whereas in the past they might have just been living in their living room because they could only afford to heat or cool one room. And this project brought together people from the public sector, private sector, nonprofits to um, get this project going. Great. Um, do you want to go to Nigeria? Oh, there we go. So um, we have started collecting examples of COVID-19 relief and recovery packages that include protections for climate change as well as improved equity. And we're calling it the GREAT database, Green, Resilient, and Equitable Actions for Transformation. This is just one of the examples we have in the database. Um, it's Nigeria's Rural Electrification Agency is partnering with the African Development Bank to fund the installation of solar panels in rural areas that currently do not have access to electricity. So. It's going to increase, you can see the related co-benefits at the bottom, um, that people that didn't have electricity before will now have it. And um, yeah, and Drew, do you want to go to the database? So here's um, our, you can find it by going under topics. And when you um, hover over topics, Drew, if you will, so they can see where to um, get to the page it'll be green equitable transformation right there that'll take you to this landing page and then you can start by um policies and actions open letters yes this is the policies page we have a map um if you scroll down this shows where these this is an ongoing database we're building it so there's also a contact form at the bottom if you guys know of any if you folks know of any other examples that are out there or you see an example on here that has some updated information or that could be expanded, feel free to use the contact forms we have throughout that, those landing pages to share that information with us. Great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Cassandra. So um, the key here, and, and one note about those two cases that's particularly important is we can't assume that the marginalized communities that need these improvements to air quality will get those benefits if we just generally adopt policies to address energy efficiency, carbon pricing, less coal. Uh, one thing we're advocating for is to couple the use of the simulator and thinking about global benefits with the active choice to say, how can we make sure that we capture those co-benefits? And that those co-benefits, such as improved air, can actually improve lives for marginalized communities. How to make this part of our planning process our climate solutions investment policy process. I want to take a step back and 
talk a little bit about the assumptions that were here and maybe call on Chris Soderquist to, who built, built this part of the model. If anything comes up, I just wanna note where we got the numbers that were behind those calculations that you just saw. And uh, a lot of it comes from a, just a high level look at where does PM 2.5 come, come from globally? And look at these areas that are not in the boxed areas, the gray and the brown and the blue and the purple. Power generation, industry, residential energy and transport. These are the areas that we modeled when you see that graph, energy related PM 2.5 emissions. We'll show you later our work for open, to capture open fires, agriculture, and other. But for now, think of it as those areas. And what we've done is, of course, in the En-ROAD simulator, we're looking at what is the uh, energy use in coal, oil, and gas. And then we captured, we figured out what we call these emissions factors. And luckily, the teams at IASA, who built the GAINS model, published what they thought those emissions factors are. And those emissions factors, and this is the little bit of the pictures of, of the model that we used, they said how many million metric tons of PM 2.5 per unit of energy. So we had units of energy in the model and we multiplied that against this emissions factor. So you can hear, see here for coal, 0.12, it says, million metric tons per exajoule. So the math is fairly simple. Multiply it, then calculate the total emissions of PM 2.5, and then do it differently for natural gas, for oil, and for bio. Um, you can see why gas is so small in the model. At 0.12, for gas, it's 0 0.0001. You can see it's much, much, much smaller. This is the study that we pulled it from, Clement et al., this IASA paper. This is the source that we used. Pretty simplified way to look at it, but it captures the dynamics we think pretty well. And we tested how well it did it by calibrating our model. And we told you, some of you more experienced folks or just even the new folks, we build our confidence in the model by looking at other simulations that are out there and that are much more disaggregated, that aren't built for online use. And we compare our results against their results. And if we're close, that builds our confidence that we're good enough for uh, the work that we're doing with it. And you can see there's some Eclipse is one of the models that we use that we compared against. And this third graph is PM 2.5. You can see it rises here, 2000 up to the future. We took that line and said, okay, let's run ours against theirs and see how did we do? You can see our comparison gains Eclipse scenario. Here it is as an index and En-ROADS, here we are. You can see we're close-ish and that build our confidence. That's how we build our confidence in the model. And I'll just pause here. Um, Chris, I don't know if you're, if, are you able to unmute or if someone can unmute Chris? Is there anything you would add, Chris, that people need to know? There could be one of the people on the GAINS team could be out there or other technical modelers. What should our world know that I'm just left out that's critical in understanding what's behind how you built this part of the model. If you're able to unmute. Oh, I've been unmuted. Um, so can you all, everybody hear me? Yeah, you sound great. Okay, great. Go ahead, Chris. Good, 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 to, good to see you, Drew. Um, you know, I think you summarized it, you know, quite well. I think the, uh, the uh, ability to, uh, to link um, emissions to uh, to the energy used um, made the uh, the modeling of this you know pretty relatively straightforward, um, and uh, you know the the distinction between coal in particular uh, relative to the others in terms of the excessive amount of PM 2.5 relative to the others I think was a is an important uh, you know point in terms of thinking about how to both um, address climate change issues and reduce pollution. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so I think that's good. Great. And Chris added a section here. If anybody wants to explore different assumptions from what Gaines had, you could go and find another study that said, no, it's not 0.12 megatons per exajoule. And no, there's that number, 0.12. We took it right from that study. It is 0.10. And if that were the case, and look over on the left, you can see that would have meant less emissions. 
See in the top left as I decrease it, or if it's higher, this is in the assumption section, you can explore actually that was too low, it's actually here. And you can also see the source here in, if you click the little area. So that's a little bit about where this is coming from. Then I just wanna name what's next. Maybe you're someone who knows about some resources out there. Please let us know if you think there's something you have that can help, but also we'll have a webinar in the future, I hope, that includes forests, fires, and agriculture. See the red box? We want to capture what are the things that can be done to decrease emissions from open fires, agriculture, and other, these other areas. Secondly, mapping air quality. Wouldn't it be cool if we could show you a map of what air quality would look like in 2030, 2040, under the scenario that you made if these policies were adopted. So you weren't just talking about temperature or a graph of air quality, but you could say, well, here's Europe. Here's what it might look like. And this is actually a picture from the Gaines model that has done this kind of mapping. Now join me in the conundrum because global policy doesn't necessarily translate to a, an equal application of that policy across India, China, US, Europe, Africa, South America, Australia, et cetera. Like, uh, would we have uniform application of policies and therefore uniform results in the reduction of PM 2.5 by geography in the real world? No, we know it's not. How could we estimate what actually happens in different regions as a result of these global policies? That's the challenge that we're facing and really one of the biggest limits to even trying to include it and one of the reasons we may not include it. Also, not just the mapping of it, but uh, how much does it help improve quality of life? Less left lung disease, less cardiovascular disease, less COPD, and then if you put it all together, how much will it improve people's lives and the length of their lives? There have been some connections in a study, Chris, you worked on this, of here are cities and if you have a decrease in PM 2.5, it has how many years of life uh, are to be expected to be increased? So you can see years of life expectancy gain from PM 2.5 improvements and mapping that, you can see that in Shanghai, it's 1.9, uh, it's 1.9 with a certain decrease. So that's how much life is being shortened by PM 2.5. So if we had less of it, would that go down to just a year. So these are some of the things that we're exploring, seeing if we can add to the model. Again, another challenge, can we make reasonable assumptions to allow this math to make sense in a real model? So I'm gonna pause there. That's the main guts of what I really wanted to lay out. Um, I will defer to my team before any questions, or to Chris, or actually I asked you Chris already, but anyone on the team, you listen to this, but you know a lot about the model as well. Uh, Ellie, Caroline, Janet, Yazzie, and on, Bindu, any, anything, uh, Cassandra, you would add that hasn't been covered? You're like, hey, Drew, you may not, you left out the part about whatever. Um, anything to add? Please unmute yourself and um, otherwise we'll get ready for questions. I hear silence, so maybe that was good enough for now. Um, why don't we look to some of the questions that are coming up and uh, see what, um, what questions people have. So this is a time, and maybe you asked a question before, and if it got missed, uh, please uh, say it again. Uh, so can you please share the source for error to uh, health impacts to air quality life reference paper. Uh, Chris, you found that, didn't you? Would you um, share that in chat? I think you're the one who found that one. Um, Allison asks, do different coal-fired power plants create different levels of PM 2.5 based on their technology and when they were built? If so, is the number you use just an average? So yes, newer power plants don't put out as much two, PM 2.5. Power plants with really advanced scrubbing technologies don't put out as much. They vary a lot around the world. So yes, the number we used 
is a global average. And if you really want to look at your area, look at a regional model to explore much more uh, the nuance and um, really what's going on locally. Find another model. This won't help with that as much. Are you going to add more factors into the model, air pollution, forest fires? How significant the impact to total greenhouse gas emissions? Oh, as we add more factors, air pollution, forest fires, how significant is the impact to total greenhouse gas emissions? Great question. Um, I'm going to go back over there to the model. As we add these things, does it change greenhouse gas emissions? No, not at all. The things that change greenhouse gas emissions, we've included here, and we may add other things that affect greenhouse gas net emissions, but those are just other indicators. So if you have over here, we add other indicators such as air pollution from energy, really we're just testing the same things, energy efficiency or more renewables. This is just another indicator. It is not something that contributes to addressing climate change. That will be something, other things that we might add to the model. Great question. What are the long-term implications of burying CO2? Uh, we don't really know. We haven't done enough of it, but this is what's called carbon sequestration. And you can go to old natural gas mines, into limestone, pump it underground. We don't really know what could happen. And of course, we're concerned about what would happen to land and whether there's subsidence of land or other things. Uh, we're also concerned that it will leak and be re-emitted later. So there could be loss. So those are some things that should be asked. Great question. Um, why not PM10, someone asked. Uh, we wanted to pick a kind of universally acknowledged air pollution size of the uh, pollution and chose that one because we have a lot of evidence of its health impacts. Um, other questions. Uh, does your model include the impact of soot on global warming potential, says Diane. What a good question. Okay, here's what she's asking about. If you burn coal, it puts soot, it puts aerosols into the atmosphere, into the stratosphere, and that reflects light. We actually, because of that, effect of coal have had some cooling. That is in the model. However, we don't have the connection yet of less coal to more warming. So the short answer is no. Thank you for the push, Diane. Can someone log that, someone on our team, let's log that and see what is the state of it, whether we put it into GitHub, because we really ought to address that, because less coal means less air pollution, it means less climate change, overall because of uh, the carbon dioxide, but it actually means more cooling. So there's many factors related to coal. Thank you. Um, some other things, soot darkening snow, another good one. Thank you. Um, others, I'm just gonna pause. Uh, has anyone on the team read some that I've skipped that felt particularly germane? I'll, I'll just let you read some out. Um, yeah, yeah, I have a few questions. Um, great. So earlier someone was Thank asking, you, Carolyn. yeah. So uh, earlier someone was asking, we're showing total emissions of PM 2.5, uh, but why we weren't looking at average levels of PM 2.5 in the atmosphere. Yeah, good question. So we have been tracking what we can track, which is emissions. And you just asked about average levels. We would call that the concentration. So the emissions is what gets comes out of the smokestacks. The concentration or burn the concentration is then what sits in the atmosphere before it is dissolved it deposits somewhere it falls to earth somewhere all we capture right now are those emissions um, and we can't yet model the concentration it is a very short-lived pollutant so it is only over i think the matter of weeks that it sits there our model is over 80 years so we don't model it at a time scale where we can capture the concentration. Short version is just, we can't. Other ones that you see, Caroline? Yeah, a few people were asking kind of um, about what features we have on the horizon. So 
One question was, uh, is Climate Interactive looking into mapping other impacts that differ on the local level, like sea level rise? And people were wondering about other co-benefits on the horizon that might be uh, included in, in inroads. Yeah, great question. Um, so the short version is mapping sea level rise, yes. So we're working on that. We're, we have a contract with Climate Central that their analysis and their mapping that you may have seen, go look at Climate Central, you'll see Surging Seas is their program and their uh, app. We're gonna be including that. They're helping us put that into En-ROADS. Some of the other equity measures that we're really interested in um, include water use by energy. Our modeler, Adam, is working on that right now. We also wanna capture household energy costs. If energy gets more expensive, what does that mean for a family that's paying for their electricity, for their natural gas, that is paying to uh, fill up their gas tank to drive? We want to capture household energy costs as another impact. Um, anyone else remind me of other things that we have queued up um, on equity measures? Those are the, the big ones that I'm excited about. Maybe that's for now. Those are some of the ones that we're looking at. Um, others that you see. Yeah, um, people were wondering um, that they've heard that a lot of PM 2.5 comes from road abrasion, um, not just energy use in vehicles. Is that included in the model? Did you say road abrasion? Yes, road abrasion. Wow. Yeah, so um, my guess is that that would be included in what we call this area, which was pretty big here in the model, um, called other. And uh, I'll uh, go back to that. So what we're going to add is open fires, agriculture, and other. And I would guess that road abrasion would have been would be one of the things that's there. Um, the challenge that we face <clears throat> is: is there anything that we can change in the model that would affect it? Are there better roads, et cetera, are out there? And, we're debating what to add, given that we want to keep the model uh, such that you don't have to go digging deeper and deeper to find uh, different policies. So they all fit here on this main screen. Other questions you see? I have one, Drew. Um, can climate change be framed as a part? Can climate change be framed as a part of a global, mental, physical, and ecological health crisis? Can it be framed as a global mental, physical, and ecological health crisis. Ecological, uh, yes, it can, I bet. And I, I, I'm guessing that the person who asked the question has, a, has an idea about how to do it. Um, we like to think of it as the interaction of these physical systems with our economic systems, but together, maybe you said mental, but you know, we think of it as mental models, is how do we, react to the information that we get as we look off into the future and see where things are headed as we look and see the impacts of climate change today how does that lead us to take action and really that's what we're trying to simulate with the use of the simulator is you reacting to information and then making changes here in the model to say if we understand things are headed where we don't want them to be headed like this uh what are the kinds of things that we could do in the world and test that in the model. Thank you. Other questions? Boy, there's so many. I see they're just showing up in the question box. You guys are doing a great job of putting them out there. Yeah, Other um, another, qu another question uh, asked earlier was, how do you recommend explaining the difference between pollution like CO2 emissions that spread globally and emissions, including particulates that are more concentrated and thus have greater impacts regionally near the source of emissions? Yeah. So maybe from like a presentation point of view when you're working with a model. Right. That's a good question. Um, that's, I think you named it in the way you asked the question, which is make the distinction between global dynamics and then regional dynamics. Whether that region is your neighborhood and community, your business, your state, your country. So use En-ROADS to think about the global dynamics and put it aside and then talk about your area. If we were talking about air quality, you would make these changes and say, here are the things that help, here and here and here. Let's now look at our state. Let's look at our city. And then say, well, 
what are the sources of air pollution here? Go research them. Where are the coal-fired power plants in the area? What is the what are the sources of PM 2.5? You could probably find that information. So that's where you put En-ROADS aside and talk about what's really going on wherever you are. With En-ROADS having done some critical things of having people see what's high leverage and low leverage, what are the in relationships, help them set a vision of where they want to go, get excited about the global movement, put it aside and talk about regional dynamics. The good old phrase, think global, act local, really applies here. Think global, act local. Other good questions, Caroline. Yeah, people were wondering if the effect of air quality on GDP and population growth rate is included. Is the effect of air quality on GDP and population growth rate? The short answer is no, it's not. Um, we're not yet quantifying what air quality does to economic growth. Now, certainly, uh, you've got to wonder when you're in cities where that it's so bad. I'll say it again. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, in the United States, where in the 70s, the air pollution was so bad that businesses would not locate in the city because of these air pollution problems. It definitely had an impact, but we have not been able to quantify that impact. That said, Savelle, the modeler from our team, is working right now on the effect of temperature on GDP per capita growth rate, and that will be coming out in a future version of En-ROADS. Other questions? Yeah, um, one person was wondering how will we continuously uh, update the data for this section yeah. of the model? How do we continuously update the, the section of the model? We love reading research papers here on our team. We're now a team of 13 people and uh, we read a lot of papers and see what's the new information that comes out and when it's relevant to what we're doing and how we've modeled things we change the numbers in the model. It happens that right now or an hour ago, John Sturman and Lori Siegel were meeting because there's more and more evidence that renewable energy has been getting cheaper and cheaper, faster and faster. So we're improving that in the model right now because of more and more evidence. So uh, vigilance and being a good scientist with a fast turnaround time of putting things in the model is, is what we depend on there. Other questions? Uh, this is a little less related to air quality, but someone was wondering if there are any plans to add hydrogen production sub-options to the model for renewables, nuclear, and new tech. What a good question. Any, anything to add hydrogen. Now think of hydrogen. When I learned about hydrogen, I heard it as a fuel source. I thought that's what it was. It's like, oh, we're going <laughs> to burn hydrogen like it's like as if it's like coal oil and gas um it's really a carrier of energy so you've got to make the hydrogen usually it's natural gas or wind or solar so you have to have an energy source like we've modeled here but it makes it easier to use it in transportation it's a good way to take natural gas and renewable energy it could be coal and then use that in uh, transportation so we think of it that way as an energy carrier. Um, and we're not explicitly thinking of adding it except and in this simplistic way that we have right now as a way of kind of like storage of energy so that when we use renewable energy, it gets easier to store and therefore use. So the way to kind of capture some of the dynamics would be to imagine a breakthrough in cost reduction of storage that allows renewables to grow a bit more so that we could have more growth of renewables. That's a short answer. We will revisit this as we learn more about it and can think about how we can model it. Other questions? Yeah, we've, we've got a few questions about coal um, and I know you can definitely get excited answering this question, Drew. What's the difference yeah. between clean and dirty coal? Um, and then just talking a little bit about um, if different uh, coal plants, like older coal plant technology might produce more PM 2.5. Right. And if so, is this number we use in the model just an average of uh, right. different types of coal technology? Great. 
Thank you. So out there in the politics of the issue, I'm just going to give you the headline um, about coal. And I'm going to go back and show you some of the these issues that I'm talking about and how concerning it is because of the political framing of it. This is how people want to talk about it. Clean, carbon neutral coal. Clean coal. Now is the time. So the headline is, there's no such thing as clean coal at the large global scale. One could imagine one coal-fired power plant that uses all the technology that could scrub a good bit of the PM 2.5 and the NOx and the SOx and capture much of the CO2, but that is not practical at the scale that really matters for public policy. There's no such thing as truly clean coal. They're going to emit these pollutants, particularly at a large scale. So when you look at it in the model, let's just capture what is meant by it. So when people say it, what they mean is, could we have coal with CCS, carbon capture and sequestration? And again, that's a technology that captures what comes out of a coal-fired power plant, uses energy to liquefy it, put it in a pipe, put it into the ground. And there are power plants that are testing this, and there could be more and more of them. Let's look and see how much more and more of them we could see. So I'm going to go under here, under coal, and we're going to look at coal primary energy demand by area. I think I can find it right here. Uh, coal primary energy demand by area. There it is. Okay, there's the same graph. So what we're going to do, I want you to look at the line for coal, and we're going to go under here under coal, and then we're going to say, all right, Imagine coal CCS were suddenly cheaper around the world and more and more power plants were able to get added with it. You don't put it on old ones. It mostly get, it's, it's, it's part of new ones that get built. In China, India, Africa, where most of the building of new power plants is going on. What if they suddenly get cheaper? So I'm going to hit coal CCS, research and development, breakthrough cost reduction. Suddenly they're 15% cheaper and suddenly they get subsidized a good bit. Look over in the top right corner, and you're seeing this black area. That is coal CCS for electricity. You can see that we're getting more and more of it over time. So this is coal-fired power plants that could have these scrubbers. The most important thing to notice is that it is a small amount of the potential future coal-fired power plants that are out there. So look at the yellow and then the darker area. That is all the coal that's getting burned that doesn't have the CCS. So people are imagining that when they talk about it in the marketing sense, oh, there could be so much of it. It's not practical and nobody, even the biggest advocates for it, imagine there being a huge amount, just kind of on the margins, we could see some of this. So. There is no such thing at a global scale in a policy sense that will address the, this challenge as clean coal. And along the way, note that as you do this regarding, this is just the carbon dioxide, um, as we've been showing you all through this webinar, when people say clean coal, they're implying that it would not have the air pollution problems that it does, but it will. And that's what we've modeled here is that that those emissions of PM 2.5, but also SOx and NOx that create surface ozone and other health problems as well, is a given when you burn coal, unless you have really advanced scrubbers that clean out the SOx and the NOx. Okay, uh, that's a little rant on it. Uh, and other questions that you're seeing um, that would be important to address. I think that's answering uh, most of the things I've seen so far. Um, right. We could walk, I, if anyone else on our team wants to come off mute, if they've seen any other questions, uh, but we could also uh, walk people through some of our resources once more, just on our website, potentially. Yeah, so uh, particularly for the newer people that are out there, uh, what we have on our website, of course, is 
the model itself. So more, if you want to learn more about the model, it's documented, it's explained. There are many resources. Caroline built these buttons and these diagrams you just saw. So this is where you can go learn about how to play with the model, how to run it in a workshop, how to run it in a game. If you're teachers, there's an assignment that's built around it. All the resources are here. And right here at the top is the simulator itself. So you can go there and click on it and it's free. Can someone just grab the URL and send it in chat right now? Go play with the model yourself. Go play with air quality. But also we invite you, if you're really curious about this, and I know many of you have done this already, to become an ambassador. Learn how to engage other people with the model. The ambassadors are around the world, 40 countries, 210 of you ambassadors. You've engaged almost 30,000 people all around the world. And we really hope that you can uh, join this group. How do you do it? You join the training program and, oh, join, watch the webinars. This is it, watch the webinars. So what we have is eight training webinars that teach you about how the model works, how to run a workshop, how to run a game, how we built confidence in the model, how to facilitate so that people laugh, cry, and commit themselves to being the biggest and most powerful climate leaders they can be. How to bring in these equity, justice, multi-solving issues that I brought up here with number six in multi-solving. Join the training program in order to be part of our work. There's also significant resources. If you just wanna dive into the topics that we talked about, such as multi-solving, many case studies, research, videos, slides that you can learn about resources such as the FLOWER, the Framework for Long-Term Whole System Equity-Based Reflection. And then when you run a, a game or a workshop, we hope that you register it so that you put it on that map that I just showed you. It's almost the top of the hour. So with that, I think I'll just bring us back to where we started, which is we're feeling the implications of climate change. How do we deal with it? We talk about it, we don't bury what it feels to be a human today with the world as it is. That's why I asked you to talk about the impacts you see where you are at the start. But secondly, we take action. We find ways to enroll other people, public policy, business, investment, our own time, our families, our worlds, in doing all we can to both prevent climate change through lowering greenhouse gas emissions, but also making sure that we do those, enact those policies in ways that actually help create a more equitable world and making the world better, particularly for marginalized communities that need improvements, particularly to their air quality and do other things now, not just decades into the future to do those things, to name our feelings, to name what it means to be alive today and to commit ourselves to action despite all the pressure just to put the fires out. It's not gonna be easy, it's gonna be worth it. So go get them. I will stick around for another minute or two um, afterwards. Um, actually, we did answer all the questions. I'm not gonna stick around. We're gonna just end this webinar and hope that you can make a big difference in the world. Okay, bye-bye.